Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's such a privilege to sit here this afternoon with Leisha and Christu. Um, today is a really special session because they will share their journey that they had to walk through with Abba Father before they met each other, before they met their perfect match in Abba Father, and the lessons they had to learn and go through to really grow in their relationship with Abba Father, but also to become a whole self so that they can become whole for their partner in the marriage. So welcome to the both of you. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. It's great to be here. <laughs> so I'm so excited. We have had so many, sorry, we've had so many people asking us for this testimony. And um, I, th I believe this is going to be very powerful for the body of Christ for with the lessons that we learned in the journey. Absolutely, absolutely. And we praise Abba for this opportunity that is making it possible. Um, so yes, Christy, maybe we can start with you. If you can kick us off with your journey that you had to go through before meeting Lisha. Yes, thank you, Lisha. So just a little uh, background about myself. Uh, first of all, um, all glory and honor to our Father in heaven, who has dealt bountifully with me in this whole journey. And I just want to, yeah, just give him all the honor and praise for, you know, what he's, um, how he's carried me through all of this mm -hmm. and brought me to the day. It's just his grace and his mercy. So first of all, my name is Christu Kampfer and I am 31 years old. I uh, was born in Pretoria, <laughs> raised in a Christian home and yeah, the, the, the normal, uh, I grew up in a, uh, a Dutch Reformed church and gave my heart to Jesus uh, when I was eight years old. Um, and yeah, that's when my journey started. And during this period, um, I didn't really understand what it means to have a living, intimate uh, relationship with God. And um, then at the age of 14 years old, my dad uh, received a revelation while he was in Israel, mm -hmm. uh, where the Holy Spirit spoke to him and said, uh, Jesus is a Jew. <laughs> and uh, through that revelation, um, my father, uh, the Holy Spirit birthed a love for the Old Testament um, mm -hmm. in my father's heart. And also, well, then my father st started asking questions um which, which he could not get answered um in the normal mainstream churches so he started investigating the scriptures himself and he found a lot of new revelations and one of the biggest new revelations he found was the baptism so he then uh, taught us about the baptism and uh what the bible teaches about it and um what god uh, commanded us to do essentially if we really want to live a, a fruitful life in Christ. And so we were convinced we went, uh, it was me, when I say we, it was me and my twin sister, I have a twin sister. And um, we went to see a counselor for the first time. So I was completely new to this. Um, and this is also when I found out about uh you know, uh, demons and deliverance and all of that. I was completely surprised to see uh, the reality of that mm -hmm. in that moment. So God then started uh, with his first, um, how can I say, intimate uh, journey from that point on in me and my sister's lives. Um, and all of this, you know, through the initiation of the Holy Spirit speaking to my dad about the Old Testament. And after that, it we got baptized and we renounced the infant baptism. And as, as the Lord led us uh, and showed us what, where it really comes from, the root of it, as the Bible says, we need to taste all things. Mm -hmm. um, and yes, then we would have del delivered from that as well. And then I felt completely immune to sin. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, 
But the one thing I did not understand at that moment in time is the covenant. Is mm -hmm. what Yeshua, Jesus, asks of us when we enter into a covenant with him. It's not just an intimate relationship. It's a covenant where it's a life for a life. Mm -hmm. And so I was under the impression, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm essentially making this commitment towards him but not essentially giving my whole life to him, which includes my will, my appetites, what I like, what I don't like, um, what I want to do, uh, what I want to do with my life, my calling. It's it, all of that. I just thought, okay, I read the Bible every day and pray away and that's it. <laughs> um, so Jesus also says in Luke 14 that you have to calculate the cost before Uh, you start building a house. Otherwise, you will be ashamed because you will not finish building it. Um, that also uh, correlates with the uh, scripture in Matthew where Jesus speaks about the parable of the uh, seed, the sower, and uh, the, uh, some of the seed falls on uh, uh, the rocks and some between thorns and some on uh, fertile ground. Mm -hmm. And... Um, So many Christians have a similar testimony where they meet Jesus, they go to a mainstream church and they meet him and they give their lives to him, but they don't really understand the covenant. Mm -hmm. um, and then they, you know, under excitement and, um, you know, because everybody's doing it, they make this sort of half-hearted commitment and without calculating the cost first. Mm -hmm. And Sadly, so the cost isn't explained in mainstream churches. And where Jesus clearly says in Matthew 16 uh, that those who want to follow me needs to pick up the cross, deny themselves and follow me. So it means literally to die to your own will and your own flesh mm -hmm. and uh, not to walk in flesh, i.e. Um, doing worldly things, um, looking at worldly things, spending your time on worldly things, going to parties um, and, you know, not controlling your emotions, bearing mm. the fruit of the spirit, bearing fruit of flesh, etc. cetera. Um, not, you know, unforgiveness, um, adultery or uh, fornication. Um, yeah. There's so many uh, sins that, that, that the media mediocre Christians uh, deem still to be okay, which is, not what Jesus uh, requires. So he says we need to give um, our lives and follow him and do as, as, as he did and as he commanded us to do. And not only not do things, <laughs> not, uh, not only not sinning, but also starting to follow him and mm -hmm. walking out the calling. As we read in John 15 as well, that says that we have to bear much fruit and those who do not bear fruit will be cut off. It's a very harsh word, but That is what he requires. Mm -hmm. So what, what's even more harsh to that word that I never understood is even if you bear amazing fruit, he cuts that amazing fruit off. So you can bear it, more fruit. To make it even better. So if you if you bear bad fruit or good fruit, he basically he prunes he, he cuts it. Yeah. He prunes good fruit, he prunes bad fruit. And um, because he wants to take us from glory to glory, he wants to have us grow. He wants to, after after the, that process, there there definitely is a process of a dying to self mm -hmm. that most mainstream churches don't really teach. Uh, most of the time, it's more about the self, more about what can God do for me. But mm -hmm. uh, after giving your life to the Lord, you go through a desert. And that desert is uh, painful and it's sometimes lengthy in order to die to yourself. Yes, yeah. thank you, my wifey. So <laughs> she uh, actually brought me to the next uh, critical point in my testimony. So exactly after my baptism, it's the same what happened to me. Mm -hmm. What happened to Hua? He went through the desert and he was tested. Um, and I was not prepared for this. <laughs> um, so we were baptized. I felt immune to system. I felt absolutely amazing. And I had this amazing feeling of God's presence. And it was just like this honeymoon phase with God. But then the desert season came. And the desert season included uh, my parents who got a divorce. Um, 
we lost everything financially. We needed to start over. I needed to start working. Um, this is, was when I was 16 years old. Um, and, uh, you know, at, at that age, it's, uh, I'm, I'm still in high school. It's, it's a lot of responsibility to carry mm -hmm. on your shoulders. And mm -hmm. I started asking questions. God, why is this happening? Uh, why are you allowing all of this? Um, you know, I've got this uh, new relationship with you, but now I'm going through all these hardships. Um, and one day, uh, they were a lot, without sharing too much detail, um, there were a lot of accumulated, um, how can I say, disappointments um, within this desert season, which I questioned God. And then there, there was this one specific day, my sister and I uh, rode to school on my motorbike every day. And when we arrived uh, at, at school, my helmet, the lock in my helmet, <laughs> uh, did it, it was jammed, so it didn't want to release. So okay. I was extremely, that was like the, the last point <laughs> of all the disappointments in my days that... Um, it might seem small, but you know, if a lot of things accumulated, yeah, you, you finally reach that reached point. That and I prayed, <laughs> yes, I prayed to God that that same moment, and I was like, God, I don't understand, you know, there's nothing in it, um, in serving you, mm -hmm. um, because I ask you things, things go wrong, things don't go turn out as planned, um, it, it's just you know, I'm going through this heavy desert season. And this one thing I ask you now, I know you are all powerful. Nothing is impossible for you, Luke 134. Mm -hmm. And I pray now, Luke 134, over this lock, that you will open this lock when I come back uh, off to school. <laughs> I don't want to wait. I want to get home. I'm tired. And you must unlock this lock. Otherwise, there's nothing in serving you. Mm -hmm. All right. So... This uh, bell rang. I went to my motorbike. Lock was still jammed. And I was standing there and literally I felt so depressed and so uh, disappointed because mm -hmm. I asked God, please help me. And he didn't. And then at that one, that, that same moment, I made the decision. I said, okay, God, I asked you a question, you did, you did not answer, you did not help me, so I'm going to turn my back on you today. Sure. And as soon as I said that, uh, the uh, 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 one old man, God sent an old man, right after I said that, he sent an old man um, who asked me, um, he was one of the um, handymen at school doing the maintenance, and he asked me, what's wrong, can I help you? And I said, <laughs> A lot jammed, and he said, "Okay, let me get my toolbox quickly." And he uh, unjammed it quickly, and it was fixed. So now I was sitting there. I was like, "Okay, so God actually answered my prayer, but now I've already turned my back on Him." But not realizing the strength of words and vows, mm -hmm. that's when my life started to spiral out of control completely. I started to this void in my heart which only God can fill in the world I went to worlds I uh, tried most of the things that the world can <laughs> uh, can give you and um, the more I tried um, the more empty I felt and the void just went deeper and deeper and deeper um, and you know there's a saying that says for every level there's another devil so and sin will always take you further than what you want to go. Sure. So I, I always thought, listen, um, maybe if I do this, which is a little bit more exciting, a little bit more pleasing, a little bit more promising, mm -hmm. um, I always hit a lower low afterwards. So the Bible says this way, the wages of sin is, is death. So mm -hmm. it's almost like death. You get this instant gratification, mm -hmm. but then you have to, when the uh, uh, installment comes every month, you have to mm. pay that installment, which is very bitter. Mm. And that installment is always death. Death in what? Death in your relationships, your relationship with God, your finances, 
<clears throat> your health, um, your success um, at, at, at what God has called you to do, everything starts to die slowly. And that's what the enemy came to do is he came to steal, destroy, and kill. Yeah. And this is how he, he does it. He can't make us do things, but mm -hmm. he can cause frustration. He can cause difficult times, which God also allows to test our faithfulness towards him. And as soon as we make the decision and say it with our words, then the enemy has won. Mm -hmm. And that's exactly what he, what he wanted when I spoke those words. Sure. So I continued on this journey, feeling a little bit more empty. At the same time, I was still playing drums in mainstream church. Nobody asked the question. <laughs> you know, at the at weekends, um, after sc school, I was living in sin. Um, Sunday morning, I rock up at church. Hey, how are you doing? Oh, how was your weekend? Oh, it was amazing. I went to this club last night, whatever. You know, had a couple of drinks. Oh, that's cool. You know, and then we go onto the stage thinking we can worship God that way. Um, which I also have a completely different testimony in terms of how God changed that completely in my life. In terms of a peer worship and how he wants to be worshipped. Um, and then what happened was I reached, I were at, at that stage, at 18, the, the age of 18, I met a girl and she was very pure and innocent and she was in church and I met her at church and because of her purity um, I want I calmed down a little bit in the world and but it wasn't upright purity before God it was just you know not doing things not living an active holy life bearing fruit for the kingdom so God sent in my life to, uh, as, as a sort of grace spirit in the sense of that I wouldn't go as far, completely just destroying my life. Can I just quickly say something? <clears throat> At that stage, you were very broken. Yes. And you didn't really um, got healed or got healing from your wounds. Yeah. You still had your wounds. You still had your brokenness. But you did have a desire to live pure. Yes. To not lose yourself completely. Yes. So you, in one part of you had a desire to live pure, but you were very wounded mm -hmm. and your wounds still consumed you. Yeah. Um, not completely healed. Mm -hmm. Okay. At the same time, my dad and my sister were still very devoted to God. Mm -hmm. So because I was living on the same roof, they also had an influence in terms of, um, you know, knowledge about the word. Um, they would constantly speak about the word. So I, I would still grow a little bit in knowledge of the word also being in church on sundays listening to the sermons um so it wasn't like that stopped completely but i was one foot in the world one foot in the church okay. and we were seven years together and i thought this was my wife it was however a very unhealthy relationship and there were many reasons for that, but one or two of the main reasons were, firstly, we just dated to date. So if you date to date, you're wasting your time completely. Um, we've got, God has taught me that you have to meet someone and then pursue them for a specific purpose, and that is marriage. Otherwise, you're wasting the person's time. So if you're not ready to get married, you're not ready to start dating. That's the principle God showed me. You're just going to frustrate yourself. You're going to frustrate the people around you. You're going to hurt gonna hurt people. people. Um, mm -hmm. So that's just one thing I want to put out there. Now, uh, just uh, an additional thing I want to put out there. Because of the system we're living in today, it's difficult because we get prone. We start to, to our bodies are prone for marriage and children um, when we are at the age of 12, 13, 14, and that's the age when they got married back in the biblical times. Mm -hmm. But now, during a, because of our system, we need to be able to provide financially for our families. Um, you need to get matric, and then you need to study another three, four years, and then work another three, four years to get a decent salary to be able to provide for your mm -hmm. um, you know, family. So that puts us between a rock and a hard place. What do we do? 
you know, uh, the time is a problem. <laughs> so this is the journey that God took me through. Mm-hmm. And, um, you know, I would advise, you know, where God's will is, he will provide. Keep yourself mm-hmm. pure. And at the right time, he will uh, reveal the person to you when you are in a position to to marry. Mm-hmm. Okay. So um, that's just what I want to put out there. Yes. Sorry, I just want to add on to what you're saying. I think especially if Abba Father really presses it on your heart that you need to stay pure and you need to stay committed to him until he sends the right person. Being in that singleness isn't easy, but if it's um, in obedience towards the Father, then you know the person that he's going to send to you is going to be worth it because he's probably preparing someone else that's going through another journey but also being pressed like an olive press so that you guys can unite at his time that is so spot on and that's part of our testimony as well which we'll share a little bit later so the, the that was the first reason intentional dating the second reason was um we did it for the wrong reasons um we just wanted to fill a void it's nice to have someone that loves you, that you can hold hands and mm-hmm. embrace and say that they love you and appreciate you. Um, but, you know, uh, that's <laughs> not really required um, from somebody else when you walk the singleness journey. Um, and I'll share a little bit more about that later on. Mm-hmm. And um, the third thing was, uh, which was really detrimental to our relationship, is um, the, the the relationship was unhealthy in a sense that her parents did not want to accept me. In a sense of, they thought that they were that, that she was too young to date, which I agree. She was fourteen years old. I was eighteen years old, and but they they completely rejected me. So. Um, there's a difference between saying, listen, we love you, you're, you're, you, you, know, you know, you're an amazing person, but the time is not right and just completely shutting off. You know, they could have built a relationship with me, spent time with me, um, even uh, invite me for dinner so they can see my heart and who I am. Yeah. And um, but that was completely off the cards. They really, um, uh, how can I say, tried everything in their power to stop the relationship without uh, uh you know uh, not in a loving way so if there was this dynamic of me feeling rejected by parents not mm-hmm. accepting me and us wanting to love each other but we can't really so we did it in secret so we would always send each other messages as far as we could and uh, see each other at church only on sundays um <laughs> so we didn't focus on the message at all which is looking into each other's eyes. So it was completely um, unhealthy. So then I started studying um, at the age of 19 um, at the University of Pretoria, um, mechanical engineering. And then finally, after three years of studies, she started to study LLB law so we could start to see a little bit more of each other. And her parents always said that she could only start a... Uh, dating relationship when she's finished with school which is kind of makes sense on what I've said uh, again the way it was held, uh, dealt with could have been done more loving and differently all right so now we could start seeing more of each other during this period and yeah it was amazing and uh, but still we weren't in it with God mm-hmm. so it was still unhealthy um, I made some mistakes that hurt her. She made mistakes that hurt me. And we didn't know how to deal with it because we didn't have God in it. Mm-hmm. And we fought, fought more than what we loved each other. So it was kind of like 80% fighting, 20% loving. Right. There's always that principle. Um, and if that's what's happening in your relationships, please stop. <laughs> or just pause and see God in that at at that point Mm -hmm. and because we weren't in the relationship for such a long period of time we thought okay uh this must be meant to be Mm -hmm. and we thought listen um we love each other um there won't be anybody else for me because 
you know, we've been in this at it so long, so why stop now? And it's also, you know, the effort of starting to know somebody from the start and start over. And also, you know, uh, this the, we, we were committed towards each other. So now you need to taste the other person's commitment, et cetera, et cetera. I think an important part is mm. I was also in a, in a long-term relationship. I'll share that a bit later. But fear of the unknown. Yes. You know, you yeah. feel this is your safe space. Mm. And um, yeah, in my case, it was a bit different. I had a lot of word from the Lord. But you feel, I mean, there's, there's no way. You feel like there's no way anybody else could love you. There's no way that there's going to be a different person for you out there. So because of fear... Um, of the unknown you struggle to get out of something that you need to get out of mm -hmm. um, and I do think a lot of people who have a long-term relationship do struggle to get out of that mm. relationship because they're used to it they're used to the abuse yes. that they don't even see it as abuse anymore mm -hmm. if there's abuse in a relationship for that long you you actually think it's normal that that that's just yes yeah that's very true yeah so you know, the, the word says this way, do everything as if you do it unto God. So we didn't do the relationship as if we did it unto God. We didn't know him in our relationship. We didn't ask him, are we meant for each other? Did you, is this part of your plan for us? And this is also a very important principle that I want to put out there. Um, they, if you think you've met the Mr. or Mrs. Right, what do you base that on? Do you base it on just feelings or did you see God's face in this whole uh, pursuing process uh, mm -hmm. towards that person? And, um, think, and yes. in addition to that, I also want to say that it can go the other way as well. Not seeking advice. Yes, it's good to seek advice from others, but not to base your opinion of, of whether someone is right or wrong for you because someone else said something but rather to yes. ask our Father to give you confirmation, whether it's in his word, whether it's through a dream, whether it is through witnesses, but to test those witnesses then with his word as well. Perfect, perfect. And on that note, for instance, I do believe that God prepares a person for you. Mm -hmm. So, but it, But that means he can prepare anybody for anybody. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he and picks people this person he's the perfect matchmaker which mm -hmm. means if you are in an unhealthy relationship and it's not working out and you have not received confirmation from God that doesn't mean that you'll uh, miss your Mr. or Mrs. Right yeah. and that's the fear that a lot of people live in especially in long relationships mm -hmm. they think they're going to miss their Mr. Mm -hmm. or Mrs. Right mm -hmm. So God is the one who ordains your Mr. and Mrs. Wright. He prepares that person for you to be your Mr. and Mrs. Wright. While, and very important, he prepares you first. <laughs> so God always starts with you. He always starts with his own people first. Before he starts to judge the iniquity of the world. You can see it right through the history of etc. Okay, so that's very important. You must focus to become the person you want to marry mm. and as soon as you start on the journey and have progressed well on that journey then god will um start make uh, you know uh, showing you that person which he has prepared for you that's a part of our uh, testimony as well mm. all right so then at the age of uh 25 2017 um, after basically being seven years together, I started reaching breaking point. So I've gone through the world. I've tasted what the world can provide for me. And it is so when you're young and you're attractive and you've, you're talented and gifted, the world can provide a lot for you. And that's why we've got the parable in Matthew 13, the parable of the thorns. When uh, we get tempted by the world, um, we, t we, we tend to uh, choose the worldly things, which, which promises instant gratification and pleasure. But mm -hmm. the long-term effect is detrimental and death, as I've mentioned previously. 
So I started to see that nothing that the world can can um, give me uh, is worth it and sustainable and will bring forth uh, good fruit. It always left me more empty at the end of the day. So then I got this very vivid dream where I, I was walking through the desert and without any hope of being rescued. And then all of a sudden I slipped and I fell into a big hole and broke my leg completely. Sure. And, and <laughs> at that moment, you know, it, it, when I thought it, I couldn't feel even less um, hopeless. <laughs> um, more I, hopeless. You know, uh, more hopeless. Um, that's why God gives you <laughs> a spouse to also help you <laughs> when you're wrong. Okay, so um, so I felt even more hopeless, mm. and when I thought I couldn't, and then God, uh, then I woke up, and the Holy Spirit told me, "You can continue on this road, but the longer you continue, the harder it will be to get out." Sure, that that is the truth, and yes. it's also true in my testimony. The longer you continue in a situation that you know it's not bringing forth life and fruit, it is much difficult, much more difficult to get out of it as time con continues. Yeah. So that completely shook me. And I started thinking about sin in a different way. Every time I thought, okay, listen, whoa, if I do this now, I know there's going to be a high level. It's going to be deeper. It's going to be more detrimental. Mm -hmm. So when I started to try and um, refrain from sin, it started to swallow me even more. Mm -hmm. So it was this, so I was already almost in the pit in the desert. Mm -hmm. So it was so difficult for me to stop with the sin I was busy with that I've, I've, it felt like I was drowning. So, I also saw that the sin was manifesting um, in my physical life, in my re relationships with other people. I was hurting people. I was egotistic. I was selfish. I was, you know, I was not you know, prideful, not bearing good fruit. So it was affecting the people who I loved around me. So that's also another very important point I'd like to mention is when you sin, you don't only hurt yourself, you hurt the people you love. Mm -hmm. And that's why it's important to deal with sin in your life so that you can be a blessing mm. towards other people. And that's the the whole goal of the law is that you will love your neighbor as yourself mm. and God with all your heart, mind and strength. So sin brings hurt. It brings death in and the closest relationships around you. Yeah. All right. So then I, uh, I reached breaking point. Um, in 2017, 7 January, <laughs> um, when my, um, so usually me, my dad and my sister went away on holiday. Um, we were very close. Uh, we didn't have a lot of friends because my dad and my sister was walking a very straight and narrow path. Um, you know, as soon as you start walking on that path, you lose a lot of friends, especially for the first period of that period. Um, and uh, yeah, but it, you know, it was only the three of us. So mm. because my dad and my sister was very um, committed yeah, committed and living a pure a pure lives, they could pick up things from, from me. Um, and my dad, this is one thing I'd also like to put out there for parents. Um, one might think, okay, where was my dad in all of this <laughs> mess? And he was always there. He loved me through it all. He never forced me to do anything. He allowed me, like the prodigal son, to take my inheritance, to go into the world, spend it, okay, hoping, going out every day, looking over the horizon, hoping that the prodigal son would return one day. Mm -hmm. And this, is, this was exactly the heart of my dad. So that my dad was a big uh, pillar in my life um, who brought me here today. And I just want to give honor where, where honors do you. And I really pray that God will bless him for his obedience in his life. But essentially what happened then, my dad felt um, that he needed to uh, yeah, help me in love, to tell me 
my sin in love and that the sin is getting the better of me. So we were in Grootbrak. Uh, it's close to Mossel Bay, <laughs> a very special area for me. We are currently living close to that area. Um, and one day uh, my dad told me, Krista, you have to look at yourself. Um, you are completely changing. You're not on the right path. Your fruit is horrible. Horrible. <laughs> it smells. <laughs> um, and you'll have to seriously look, uh, do some introspection. Mm -hmm. And now I've got a lot of respect for my dad because he's always loved me, as I've mentioned. He's always provided. And that really shook me. So that evening, uh, 7 January 2020, uh, 2017, I uh, reached out to God and I told Yeshua, if you save me from the sin, then I will serve you unconditionally, sure. wholeheartedly. I think uh, an important point in that uh, co a covenant or commitment that he made this was an unconditional commitment from his son, but his first commitment at the age of 14 was for sure conditional. If you make my life fantastic and wonderful <laughs> and glorious, mm -hmm. I will serve you. And one was, it doesn't matter what I go through in life, you are God. Yes. And I will serve you unconditionally. Amen. <laughs> so he heard my cry. He... Um completely changed my heart that was again uh you know hardening it was the born again <laughs> moment yes and um i i had to start the cleaning process and the healing process which was difficult and this is what a lot of people don't realize uh, especially people who are still new in their journey uh with god is that when you give your life to God and you recommit and you um, reinstate the covenant with him. Mm. Yes, you are delivered. You are, as uh, how can I say, um, reaccepted into uh, God's kingdom, but getting uh, and also saved. Um, but the deliverance process, the transformation process, as to read in uh, Romans 12, is a difficult and long and hard process yeah so the getting saved is easy you yes. know <laughs> it's in a moment you can get saved without paying a price yeah. but to get delivered costs you a lot yes it's costly to walk the process of holiness and deliverance and keeping your deliverance is also costly 100 percent. and that is why jesus said if you want to keep your life you will lose it Mm. so that's part of the deliverance process is losing your life dying to self picking up your cross otherwise you are not worth following him and that is what um yeah that is what i learned in the process um so also when when we give our life to him um in in, in a covenant relationship uh, he tests us. Mm. He, uh, like he tested Israel, he said he's going to test them in the desert. Um, if you go and read, all the disciples went through difficult hardships after they encountered Jesus Yeshua. And this is um, what what is important for us to realize is that we are now here. And, uh, you know, Timothy uh, also says that those who desire to live godly lives will go through persecution and hardship. We are here to be transformed into his image yeah. and to be fruitful for his kingdom and to be the salt of the earth. So we are going to share in his sufferings. That is what the word promises. But it has eternal value and it will stop at his coming. That is when it will all stop. And that's when we have been tested and tried and weighed for mm -hmm. eternity. That's what's important. Mm -hmm. So then I cried out unto God and he delivered me. He set me free completely from sin. Um, and he took me through a, a, a six months grace period. Uh, what I mean by that is I did not 
um, start that difficult deliverance process mm. up until six months after. <laughs> because he knew that I needed his grace. He knew mm. that I was completely broken and that I needed his protection, his mercy for a season. And I think it's like uh, there's some seasons in your life that, that you can feel the hand of the Lord over you, mm. over your whole being. And, you know, you feel untouchable. You feel safe. You feel covered. You feel and, happy. You no, know, everything is fine. And the Praise the Lord. Is, <laughs> and the that the Lord starts withdrawing his hand, you start seeing, oh, <laughs> my goodness, I'm not okay. You yeah. know, I've never been. Um, I actually have so many things I need to work on. And so he does that very, very wisely, only in the way that the Lord can do it with time. And, and he takes you through a process of first building you up before breaking you down again. Mm -hmm. um, and I just, uh, I think sometimes it, it seems quite hard the way we, we talk about serving the Lord is not, it's not a joke. It's mm -hmm. not, um, it's not easy. It is difficult. Mm -hmm. um, you're going to face hard things. And when you face hard things, don't think that the Lord is not a loving father, mm -hmm. that he is not there for you. It is because of his love for you that mm -hmm. he wants to show you who you really are. Mm -hmm. It is because of his desire for you to become more like him that he reveals to you in what bad of a situation you actually are in. Mm -hmm. And um, relationships are supposed to make us more holy. It's not supposed to make us more um, happy. worldly, more happy, <laughs> um, more, you know, it's supposed to create better character in you and create holiness in you. Just like motherhood, I'm not yet a mother, but I do know that motherhood is going to take you to a next level after marriage into holiness. This is the design of your life. The Lord wants to, in seasons, form you, mold you, um, teach you. And I think a lot of people in a relationship that are that they are in very early in their life, they think that they know what is best for them. They know, you know, what they need, what is working for them, what is fitting for them, but they don't know. And mm -hmm. they do not have that wisdom yet. Mm -hmm. You need to go through this process that are difficult in order to understand the wisdom, to get the wisdom to know, okay, I was wrong. I thought this guy is perfect for me or I thought this girl is perfect for me, but I was wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and and through time, going through these things, you get to you get to understand that. Okay, but mm -hmm. finish your story. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, so at that moment, I also realized that I was in, a, in an unhealthy relationship. And that it wasn't fruitful for what God wanted in my life. So I went back home. I ended the relationship with, a, it was, I think it was one of, not, yeah, might have been the difficult thing that uh, things, one of the difficult, most difficult things that I had to do yeah. is to end a relationship. Um, I was already uh, at that stage, I had already designed the wedding an engagement ring and bought a house for us. Uh, you know, we were basically on our way to get married. And um, but because I wanted to honor God and he was my first love and I was going to serve him unconditionally and honor him in all my ways, because he says, if you love me, you'll obey my commandments. And it wasn't honoring God, the relationship. I had to step out. So that was extremely heartbreaking. Mm -hmm. um, and then I started my singleness journey from there on in 2017. Now that we're married, Crystal always references to his singleness journey as if it was extremely traumatic. <laughs> he would always say, you know, when I was still a bachelor, I had to go through all of this, you know, I had to make my own food. <laughs> Oh, uh, look after myself when I flew, etc. Um, <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's uh, that journey started. I was still staying with my dad and my sister, um, and in that year, uh, first year of my. Okay, so what is also important to mention is, firstly, uh, my dad did keep on interceding for me and praying for me while I was in the world. That's very important to mention. Not mm -hmm. just wait and hope, but you need to pray and intercede. 
for your children that that are that are in the world. Okay. Then secondly, my dad also rebaptized me um, because I now understood the weight of it, and I um, had to be reclaimed and mm. recommit myself, which is part of what the baptism means. I started my 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 journey in the relationship. Now I was single, and yeah, I finished my degree as as well, and I started working, and. I was very alone because now I didn't. Oh, I was still playing drums in the church, um, but I also felt while I was playing drums in the church that this is not what God desires in terms of peer worship. So God started my peer worship journey already there, um, mm. and I also uh, stopped playing drums in the mainstream church and also stopped a lot of. Uh, uh, bad friendships as well. You know, the Bible also says a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. Mm -hmm. So uh, we need to avoid, um, you know, people who aren't committed to the Lord. Okay, so it was very lonely. So I did go into my inner you know, room and pray and ask God, does he want me to get married? Or does he want me to stay single for the rest of my life? Like Paul said, and which is it would which in Paul's opinion is better, which I don't think really is <laughs> better in every case. Um, but essentially, God Paul, showed me. Paul was a very specific person. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So God showed me um, then Psalm 19, which is very important. So Psalm 19 at a um, specific uh, stage uh, starts by saying, and as the bridegroom leaves his chambers to run the race, um, and it's also a psalm that uh, the Jews also use when they get married um, in their tra tra tradition with the whole chuppah and the covering, etc. Um, then that was a strong um, confirmation that God indeed wants me to get married, but I did not realize how long and how difficult and how painful the preparation process is going to be. <laughs> so in that time, I just quickly want to say something again. Uh, you were separated from the world mm. and the Lord does this. He takes you, especially for a year or two, completely separating you from everything and just starting to teach you himself, starting to, you know, teach you how to worship him in, in, in spirit and in truth. Mm. And um, in that time, he, there was a lot of healing that took place in your life. You were completely isolated, basically. And then he, after that, took him back to a fellowship or a community. Um, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I started getting involved in a very small assembly. So it was called an assembly compared to church. Um, as Hebrew speaks, do not forsake the assemblies. And it was more ecclesia-driven than oikos-driven. Um, ecclesia is uh, more like... 1 Corinthians 14, where every person brings a word uh, and a psalm and a prophetic word um, and then combine it for a specific um, kingdom purpose. Yeah. Um, and this specific group was uh, called to break ground in South Africa, which is yeah. also very, uh, I learned a lot and grew a lot spiritually as well um, mm -hmm. by being part of this process. But they weren't very much focused in worship, um, uh, worship, uh, more specifically, instrumental worship, which is a big part of my calling. So I felt it was only for a season that mm -hmm. I needed to be there and grow and learn, which was a very um, healthy uh, season for me uh, to be in. Um, <clears throat> so at least I had a little bit of fellowship. I had some um, a, a friend or two who was committed in um in the Lord. And so my journey continued. And after one year, my dad met a, uh, his current wife <laughs> when he was, <clears throat> so my dad got divorced when I was 16. So he was single for 10 years. And then he met his current wife through me. So mm -hmm. the Lord blessed me in my job. Um, I bought my second property when um, I put it up for rental the first person who came to view the property was my dad's current wife. So um, then 
through his wife, uh, she wanted to introduce me to a girl and I was very excited. This is now here after my recommitment uh, because the Lord has showed me he wants me to get married. Mm -hmm. Right. <laughs> um, this seems like a good process. You know, I met her through my um, dad's wife and I received at least five confirmations that this is the one. <laughs> 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 at um, least five yeah. <laughs> the Lord said <laughs> okay so I was extremely excited uh, we were so excited the both of us that within the first week we went to go and look um, at engagement rings after we met each other <laughs> okay. um, a month later I phoned a dad which was at that time staying in Namibia uh, asking for a hand. He said, yes. Um, I planned a whole trip to go to Namibia to ask uh, uh, to, for engagement. And on my way, on our way to uh, Namibia, on the plane, I had the ring that I bought and everything was set up for, for the engagement. Um, as the plane took off, uh, the Holy Spirit told me, be strong and courageous, <laughs> Joshua. <laughs> so um, one was eight. So we, I was at that moment a little bit terrified because <laughs> why would the Holy Spirit tell me be strong and courageous? I'm on my way to ask <laughs> uh, for engagement. Okay, so we arrived there, and just a little bit of background. Um, you know, of, of that specific relationship. So she prayed for a godly husband, even though she was very much still in the world. So she started, the Holy Spirit started to, to work in her life. She was at that, at that stage uh, studying in uh, Stellenbosch. Um, yeah, and, and then she felt the worldly influences were too intense there. So she started praying and asked God, um, I want to start recommitting my life to you and also I'm praying for a godly husband. Then the Lord sent her back to Pretoria where I was staying then and uh, we met as I mentioned and uh, I then took her through the whole calculating the cost process, the baptism process and um, yeah, uh, we it was very special to be able to baptize her and also to start to teach her about holy living. Mm. But it was a very difficult uh, relationship because, and this is a very important principle to put out there, God can do anything, but it takes a process for you to break down strongholds in mm. your mind. That's why Romans 12 says, um, says um, you have to renew your mind. Yeah. So it's a process that we, we need to walk out. Mm -hmm. So it was a very short period that she met the Lord. I started teaching her and it was so overwhelming. It was completely out of a paradigm and a norm. Um, and she had not had time at that stage to process wounds and, and hurts and trauma and uh, paradigms and strongholds in a mind, etc. So, what happens when a person then goes through difficult times, especially then, is they tend to default to the previous lives strongholds, and that means if you normally if you uh, had to go normally if you go through a difficult uh, time, then you default to alcohol if that was your default mechanism at that time and then that, that stronghold. And uh, uh, many people default to um, unhealthy relationships, rebound effect, um, partying, drinking, um, that whole lot. So after I baptized her, she also started going through a desert. And I did uh, inform her that a desert is going to come. <laughs> she calculated the cost, everything. So uh, I, did a, I did do my due diligence. And there was this one night, I remember, when I, when I told her, one thing that doesn't make clear to me is, why would God send me somebody who's not re actually ready for marriage yet? You still have to walk out the process of healing and changing your paradigm, etc. Then she said, well, I need to feel honored to <laughs> be able to help her in this process. 
um, unfortunately, that was the problem. So when she started going through a difficult season, romance uh, tends to complicate things a lot and it makes you oversensitive as well for a lot mm -hmm. of things. So it was difficult for me to tell her things in love uh, mm -hmm. because we were so close to each other that the slightest thing could hurt her and then she would go back to her default, which was drinking and, you know, her, her partying and, and, and the whole paradigm. Mm -hmm. um, so while we were in Namibia, there were things that, that happened, trauma triggers, etc. She defaulted. I got hurt again <laughs> um, due to rejection, which I experienced in my previous seven-year relationship without going into too much detail. So then God used that to expose hurts that I needed to deal with mm -hmm. um, through her hurts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so um, needless to say, I was sent back earlier. My, my flight was um, changed to an early, earlier date. She asked me to go home. The engagement was, uh, yeah, um, oh. off, <laughs> cancelled and totaled. And uh, I was sent back and I had to face all my friends and colleagues at work, telling them it didn't work out and uh, start the healing process all over again. Sure. Uh, when I mentioned all over again, it felt like all over again, but there were deeper hurts that God showed me that time. Mm -hmm. That's when my actual very deep uh, healing process started. I started buying every book about healing, every DVD. I went on healing camps. I, went, <laughs> I watched so many uh, things on how to get healed. And um, and this is what I just want to uh, communicate today is, is that God takes us through difficult processes so that we can get healed. Because if I was in a very comfortable situation with her and if it was a uh, an, an amazing love story i might not have gone through this deep healing yeah. process in order to be transformed in order for my character to to be transformed into yeshua's image so i quickly want to say something me and christo met when i was uh 28 and you were 30 at the time it was the 29th of january we're not we don't even know each other a year at this stage. <laughs> and a lot of times we ask, like, okay, so Lord, why couldn't you have just sent Christa to me when I was 18? Why couldn't I just have met you when I was 25? Um, you know, because it would have spared so much pain in my life. Mm -hmm. But if I met him when he was 25, we would this would not have worked at all because he would not have been equipped to be in a relationship with me. Um you sometimes go through these processes that are lengthy in order. This is the equipping process. This is the uh, pruning process for the Lord to create within you that which you need for marriage. Mm -hmm. So basically after that, he, uh, his deep relationship with the Lord started. He went into ministry. Um, he was very set apart. He didn't hold a lady's hand in six years when I met him. Sure. Yes, so I'm going to get into details there. Um, okay, so then I went through my deep healing process. So one thing that I uh, committed to the Lord, and this is so something very special, you know, like David did. David said, I want to repay my vows to you um, and recite them. So which is also part of a very deep covenant, intimate relationship with God. So during that hurtful uh, process, after uh, my return from Namibia, I uh, made a commitment with God and I told him, I still want this relationship to work out. Uh, but if it doesn't or whether it does, the next Sabbath, the next Saturday, I will get up uh, at sunrise and go onto the roof and worship him. Doesn't matter, unconditional. All right. So in that week, everything, uh, you know, was... Uh, basically bitter between us and she essentially then ended the relationship over the phone sure. so uh, the next day i woke up and still fulfilled my commitment towards god i went to the roof and worshiped and that's when my uh, intimate worship journey started with god so i also stopped um, going to the assembly and god showed me i need to start um, going uh, to take uh, guitar lessons and just worship him 
on my own in my room, just me and him, and mm-hmm. build that intimate relationship. And this is now, I just want to emphasize, it was only for a season. It's good to ha- be accountable. It's good, um, and it's a must to uh, not forsake the assemblies. Um, you have to be part of a community, part of the body. Um, like the parable of Yeshua says, uh, the toe can't tell the hand, it, it does not need him. Mm-hmm. So it's really important, but this was only for a season and there's a reason for the season. Mm, and uh, so I went through this very intimate season and this is really where uh, God met me. I felt his presence tangibly. He um, touched every single hurt in my heart. Um, every single disappointment I shared with him. And he proclaimed his truth over my life. And that's when he birthed the song that I wrote it's also on, on YouTube, um, Blessed, where Yeshua said, Matthew 5, the Beatitudes, Blessed are those who are mistreated for righteousness sake. Okay. And this is what I felt like, because I felt like, I was mistreated. I was upright. I actually wanted to help her mm-hmm. to also be in a, a, a fruitful, intimate relationship with God. But look what it turned out to be. Mm-hmm. And um, so that's when God uh, met me and started really healing our hearts. And this is also very um, my heart. It's also very important to, to say. So when we take communion, we normally only focus on the blood. So, but no, Yeshua came and he gave his body to heal our wounds. That's what Luke 4 says. I came to mend the brokenhearted and to set the captives free. Mm -hmm. And then also the blood then to cleanse us. Because what happens? If we don't deal with our wounds, they lead to hurt, which leads to sin. Yeah. Hurting people hurts people. So if we don't break that vicious cycle, we will continue in sin. But if we allow God to heal us, then that's only when his communion starts to take effect in our lives. Mm, absolutely. And that's why he's so strict with forgiveness and unforgiveness. Because if we don't forgive, he cannot heal us, he cannot forgive us. And then his blood um, cannot be applied because it will be applied and applied and applied and applied. You'll continue to hurt, 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 and you'll continue to, to, to sin. So that's why the whole communion needs to be taken which includes your willingness to be healed by God completely. And it's a painful process. And then I sing further in the song, um, and I will proclaim your truth over every hurt. And that's how we get healed, is when the truth sets free. You need to understand that the enemy's game is not to uh, attack us physically with uh, with his horns and the fork. His game is in the mind. So if he can... Uh, cause you to believe a lie that's when the hurt starts and that's when the hurt leads to sin Mm -hmm. so the battle is between truth and lies so what are you putting into your mind and what are you putting into your eyes and what are you spending your time with is it with lies or is it with truth the, the word of god that's why the word says meditate on the word of god day and night so And also, um, we must speak the word um, when it's at at, when it's um, we must speak the word at all times. Essentially, that's what it what it what it boils boils down to. So, in that um, intimate place with God, that's when He started to show my calling as well, which is to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Um, John 4, 23, because that is what he wants. So mm-hmm. we can't give God anything. We can't outgive him because he's God. He's already created everything. He's mm-hmm. created everything for him. But uh, mm-hmm. Revelation says he's created us for his delight, for his pleasure. There's one thing that he asks for, that he desires. As David also said, there's one thing that he desires is worship. That's what he says in uh, John 4, 23 is uh, there will be a time and a time is now where the true worshipers will worship God at, um, in spirit and in truth, because that is what the Father seeks. So this is what God's heart desires, that is intimate worship, which includes obedience, which includes the covenant, 
which includes our commitment and includes our vows. So that's what God taught me. And he said he wants to, me to equip the body to be able to worship him in spirit and truth. But now he first needed to cleanse me. He needed to cleanse my body. Mm. He needed to show me what it is to live a set apart and holy life and not compromise. Mm. So it, that's why it took me into the desert completely set apart. I just want to say something on that. Compromise is also a big thing. Mm. Um, I think people compromise in their relationships. I think they um, they feel like, okay, this is not perfect, so I'm going to settle for it, but it's not truly what the Lord has for you. So uh, one of my big lessons that I had to learn is not to compromise on what I um, trusted the Lord. He would give me a husband. Yes. And I just want to say, with, um, just to clarify that, there's a difference between compromising and accommodating. Okay, so compromise means anything against the word of God. You cannot compromise on that. You cannot tolerate any sin or anything that's against the word of God. But accommodate, yes. She likes pink, I like green. You know, I can accommodate that. <laughs> she wants to gym in the mornings. I want to gym in the evenings. Okay, so I'll accommodate her. I'll gym in the mornings with her. It's a price, but I'll accommodate it. So... Yeah. Compatibility essentially is when both have the same um, understanding of holy living and when both have the same uh, heart towards God's kingdom. I think where I'm, when I, where I'm speaking about compromise is that the Lord placed in my heart certain things that I wanted my husband to be. And out of long relationships, you feel like, okay, but this person doesn't exist. How is it possible for me to, I mean... I've been around the country three times. I've never met <laughs> the person I want to marry. So should I compromise on it? Should I comp should I lower my standards? Mm -hmm. Should I lower my um my uh, I I wouldn't say my standards, but that that which the Lord placed on mm -hmm. your heart. Mm -hmm. Um, I, but I also think you didn't think that there would be a person out there in the world. Yes, ticking all of the boxes that ticking all the boxes. Yes. So uh, we'll, we'll share that in our next testimony on how we met. That's very interesting. Okay. So that was a very special. Yes. Sorry. I also just want to add on the part where you said that Abba revealed your calling to you in that moment of true worship. I think the same goes with compromising in terms of your calling. So if Abba gives you a specific calling, but you are impatient because you want to step into that calling now, but he's still in the process of transforming you and working on you, then you are not going to step 100% in the calling that he has called you and you're not going to live in that fullness or experience the fullness of your calling. So I think patience in every aspect, especially when you are waiting on your spouse, but also in your walk with the Father, in stepping into your purpose and your calling, it is important to ask him for guidance on when the timing is right, because he's the only one who can say, I am finished shaping you now for this. I've, I've equipped you to step into your calling, and I trust you that you that can have this calling. That's so, so true. Such an important point. So God is in the cultivating game. He's not in the instant gratification game like the enemy. Yeah. So God first prepares you for your calling. And mm -hmm. that's how um, we see right through the Bible with all our patriarchs. If you, uh, for example, David, he was anointed king seven years before he even became king. Mm -hmm. And what happened in that time? He was persecuted. He, uh, he was, uh, again, for, 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 for righteousness' sake, um, he didn't do anything wrong. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, he, he, he lost his best friend and he lost his um, wife and children for, him for, for, for a, a few days. And, you know, they, um, he was tested and tested and tested. And then God eventually um, and, and made him king, although he was already destined and, and mm -hmm. anointed and appointed seven years ago before the foundations of the earth yes well <laughs> essentially our, our callings are set then but the that's a very important principle to note is, is that you know god isn't in the game of zero to hero mm -hmm. you, you don't win 
uh, the lotto and then all of a sudden everything happens. Yeah. It's a it's a slow, painful, but precious and special process of God mm -hmm. testing you in the small things. Um, mm -hmm. You know, there's this beautiful scripture that says, humble yourself before God and at the right time, he will exalt you for his purposes, for his glory. Glory. So then uh, this is also what I want to mention. mention. Uh, during my, my singleness um, journey, I had a lot of time um, to, to, to spend in the word and spend time with God and really grow a lot. Um, but when God releases you into your calling, that's when you need to use what you've cultivated, the time you've spent in that calling. And not be dismayed when you cannot um, necessarily spend as much time with him. Mm -hmm. So that's also a lot of times where the enemy tries to dismay us in our calling. It's like, but I'm not getting to my quiet time as I used to. It's okay. God has equipped you for this time. And you need to be obedient and faithful in that. So then a year later, I went to see... Uh, a counselor um, to, to be my mentor because uh, my dad was uh, got married in the meantime. I had to move out. So it was extremely lonely. <laughs> um, at first time living on my own um, and my dad uh, needed to focus on his wife then, as Paul says. And um, so he, my dad was my main mentor. So I needed to get another mentor. <laughs> and this mentor then uh Oh, this is now after a year of intimate worship in my room, then said, oh, um, I've got this perfect uh, place for you that I want to send you. They've been praying for uh, somebody who can help them worship. Um, and uh, I went to that church um, on Pesach um, in 2021. And that's, um, sorry, in 2019. And that's when um, it, it, it was just an, an amazing divine appointment when I arrived there and um, I completely uh, was overwhelmed with God's faithfulness, we, we, he gave me my first platform of uh, my calling. So I started then to worship there, um, lead worship, and then also they appointed me to be the youth pastor as well. Uh, so I started to grow, grow myself, uh, to teach what God has taught me in my very set-apart season. And again, this is now... Uh, you know, God prepared me for this first. If he had to send me right after my, um, uh, you know, a turnaround, um, I would have completely <laughs> heard so many people around me because of my hurts and being too sensitive and thinking every second girl is maybe my wife, <laughs> going to church for to meet my wife only, you know, without it. <laughs> any other reason. Um, the rebound effect, etc. So it was really important for for uh, him to first prepare me, and so many of those worship uh, the, the previous worshippers um, in that congregation left because they felt insulted by people's opinions and uh, views of them. You know how well they sing and worship and what whatnot. Where God dealt with me. Um, about that in a lot of detail. I was once um, singing at a, a competition and I received a reward for singing. And uh, when I received the reward in my hand, God ex clearly asked me, are you going to worship for yourself, your own glory or for my glory? And then I said, no, God, for your glory and yours only. That's um, what is the most important in life because um, as Yeshua said, um, if you bring your arms, do not let your right hand know what your left hand um, does because you will already receive your reward. So when you do it for uh, to the honor of people, you will receive your reward, but it will be just that. Whereas when you worship for God's glory, it will be eternal and it will have so uh, many more um, uh, fruit in your life. Um, you know, if you go and uh, look at what the effect of pure worship was in David's time, King Josephat, where they had uh, victory over the enemies and they had peace and shalom and they had uh, blessings from other nations, etc. Just because of 
pure of worship. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, 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 it bears a lot more fruit when you worship for God only. And actually, when you want to generate worship for yourself, it's actually not for you. It's, it's for, for the kingdom of darkness. Um, but more of that in my worship <laughs> teaching, which is also on YouTube. Okay, so then uh, I was serving in this um, congregation, and it was really uh, a very special season for me. I grew a lot. Um, I was challenged as, uh, a lot as well because I had some accountability in the youth cell group where they asked a lot of difficult questions and where I was challenged. I had to go back to the word, do more research. So it was, again, a very beautiful growing process. Um, during this whole process, um, I uh, t- so this is now in 2020, two years after that first outbreak, after I um, recommitted my life. Um, it was COVID <laughs> and um, lockdown. And again, because God has already cultivated healing in my heart, I didn't feel lonely or depressed or what I'm going to do with my time, etc. I knew what my calling was and what I was working towards. So I asked God, what can I do with my time now? I was at that time in construction. So construction completely closed down. And the Lord told me, again, remember your calling. I want you to worship me in front of all nations. So immediately I was like, oh, yes, I'm going to start my own recording studio. And um, so that gave me enough time to start my own recording studio. I started recording music and put it online, uh, which uh, also uh, went out for healing um, and uh, to build up the body of Yeshua in the kingdom. And it was a really uh, exciting and very special season. Not once that I feel lonely or depressed or <laughs> that I had any need because I was busy with my calling, which is so important. Peter says, says it this way. First, above all, make sure of your calling because then you will not stumble, which mm-hmm. is really important for a newborn believer to do that um, mm-hmm. right after that re- uh, yeah, re- re- reborn. So then... In that period, um, I met uh, a girl online. She um, is a Jew. And uh, I thought, uh, and and again, a lot of confirmations uh, in this process. And I thought, again, wow, this is maybe the the one. But she was overseas and um, it was locked down and I couldn't get to her. And um, long story short, it also ended up in a heartbreak. And um, yeah, it, it just didn't work out. And... Then I asked God, what, what is this pattern? Why am I, you know, meeting people? Mm. And, you know, I've gone through healing. And again, I understand that uh, in that relationship, I also was made aware of, of more hurts, more shortcomings. And I again addressed them after the breakup. But still, God, I mean, I, it can't be this hard blow every time. And mm. then he told me just, um, it just, he just said one thing. I don't have all the answers, but he just told me that the 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 woman who accepts the cup she will be the one that you will marry oh. and i was like wow okay so it, it's 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 based on this principle if you will to love love god love your neighbor love your spouse you can and you will so it's so many times that people um aren't willing to face their hurts to face their um, shortcomings, to deny themselves, to crucify the flesh. That's when you miss the good uh, that God um, wants to give you. So it didn't work out. So then I was single again. <laughs> it was only a few months again. I still pressed in my calling, um, good and faithful servant. And um, then in 2022, so it was, again, another two years that I was single. Uh, so, again, that relationship was only online. And the previous relationship, we didn't kiss. We only held hands. So, in other words, in 2020, from 22 to 2017, it was six and something years that I didn't kiss a girl. <laughs> and five years that I didn't hold a girl's hand. Sure. Okay. Sure. Then, so God really restored my purity physically as well in my body then after that um i was content but still there were nights 
where I prayed to God. Where you cried just after. And sleep. cried and said, Abba, my heart longs for that special person, which I know you have for me, which I know you are busy preparing for me. And I pray for her. Because so many times I had this inner conflict in myself where I felt like, okay, I'm not going to pray for her because, you know, I've been hurt um, and I'm dismayed because of all the disappointments. Uh, but at the same time, how can I expect something from God without praying for it, without doing my due diligence in praying for that special someone for protection, for pre preparation? Um, and so I again got up and continued praying and praying for the special person. And do, at around June, July in uh, 2022, that's when uh, I first saw her. Uh, a profile on Facebook and that's when the journey of meeting my wife <laughs> started <laughs> so I would like to continue that in the next session so from that point so uh, he saw me in June on Facebook and he only contacted me in the next year January and met me on the 29th of January, 2023, at a conference. So to give you an idea, he took six months to pray for me. Sure. He didn't push it out constantly. I'm telling him, you know, why did you take so long? You could have just, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it would have been much quicker to just yeah. call me. Um, but to, to give you an idea how how um, serious he was about it, it, it took six months praying over it, seeking the Lord's face, praying for me, getting confirmations, really just offering it on the altar before he even came to a conference. And I had a lot of conferences, so he could have come to any one of them. Mm -hmm. But he wanted to make sure that this is not, again, just the pattern he was in in the previous season. I sure. couldn't have said it better. <laughs> Thank you, Christy. I really think um, it's amazing that you could share the detail of your journey with us, but also how Abba's hand is really woven into the whole journey. And I think looking back at it, it's probably um, it's it's easier to share your testimony than actually experiencing that walk. But what I think um, also brings freedom is that you are able to share this testimony with other people to encourage them and to motivate them as well. Because now that you look back, you can see God was always there. And that just really, um, when I hear someone's testimony, it encourages me to know that no matter what the circumstances I face or what the low point is that I am facing, he is there with me and he has purpose in that. And I can cling to his promises that he has spoken over me, um, even in the case of finding your spouse. So Thank you for being vulnerable with us and for sharing that with us. And um, yeah, I know the journey to finding Leisha wasn't easy, but I think oftentimes we also, we also cling to this fantasy that once you enter into marriage, um, it's going to be easy. It's going to be all moonshine and roses. So I know in the in the future, we're also going to speak about now that you are married, what now? But before we get to that part, we really want to hear your story as well, Nisha. But I think um, maybe let's just hit pause here for a moment um, before we continue into your journey. But thank you. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Nisha. <Lisa. laughs> 